I'm Calvin. Um, I wrote the work of library he was talking about um, back a long time ago before I realized it's kind of pointless if you don't have access to um, the, uh, if you can actually work in, in Explore. But, uh, uh, so if you want to follow it at home, this is the uh, URL. There's quite a few links in here that on that page to help you follow along. Um, I make web maps primarily. I mainly do backend stuff in Node. Um, so I think my talk title ended up just being Chris Helm looking at my GitHub like history and like picking two things that I've recently done. So it's called Pouch DB and SQL Down. Um, I understand the DB and the SQL. Yeah. So, or when Postgres is too much. So Postgres is hands down the best database. It's the best SQL one, and it's the best JSON database if you have to do queries. Like, it is head and shoulders faster, better in every possible way than Mongo, and, you know, Couch is good for, I mean, Couch TV is good for some very specific stuff, but Postgres, if you have to do complex queries, don't even bother, just use Postgres. <coughs> uh, but sometimes Postgres is, you know, a little much. If you just want to do, you know, store stuff locally, you know, do something you can use in the browser. Uh, and something that I, that's really, really helpful is Level Up, which is a wrapper around um, a thing called LevelDB, which is a simple key value database with just lexically, lexically alphabetically ordered uh, strings uh, for the keys. And it's just super simple. Um, but you can build stuff with it. So index DB in Chrome is built with level DB. Um, Pouch DB, which is a JavaScript port of Couch DB, uh, is built in on Node with level DB. So is DAT, which uh, Max Ogden, uh, who's done a lot of Geo stuff, it's his um, Git for data thing, uh, which is pretty exciting. That's all. That's built with level DB. Um, and you can have backends besides level. The default one is called level down, which is just the, the C level DB library. But you can sub in other backends, like our own called SQL down, which you can use Postgres, or SQLite, or MySQL, or WebSQL in the browser uh, as a backend. And somebody wrote, Max Ogden actually, not just somebody, uh, wrote one for index DB, which means that you can browser by code with LevelDB and use it in the browser. And use it in Node, and use it both places with the exact same code if you need to store data locally, which is just really helpful when you have, you know, large amounts of data, you know. I know somebody is doing tiles, and you can do tiles, web, you know, the download to cache, and you can do a lot of really cool stuff in the browser. That uh, So this is just Geo, so Got some geo stuff with it. Uh, so the first thing people did to try and store do geo stuff with level up is geo hashes. If anybody doesn't know what geo hashes is, are it sort of divides up the world into quadrants. So basically it says A B C D inside of them, A B C D, and just so that A you have the following A A, and that's A B, so that sort of turning your tile URLs in just a string of letters. Um, if people are giving me blank stares, um, Screen. So we'll just pretend that you understood what I was saying. Um, <laughs> and just so it's basically, it really works well with uh, level DB because it basically means that um, adjacent tiles are alphabetically next to each other. So you could just do ranges of them. Um, so 
but one of the big things about them is what's called a Hilbert curve, which is fancy talk for this one. I do have a link somewhere. So it's basically saying, making sure that all adjacent things are next to each other. So in a, uh, in a geohash, basically, A, B, C, D, A, 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 B, uh, A, C, A, D, but with uh, a Hilbert curve, you basically go, instead of over here, you go, purple, no, you know, like that, so that they're all next to each other. So the ne the tile that is adjacent in um, in just the naming scheme is always adjacent in real life, and it means that you can just do queries on ranges really easily. Um, so that was the first way people were going to do it. Um, there are like several uh, plugins for level up for level DB that people have written with uh, quadtrees, though without Hilbert curves. Um, and then I decided to top by doing a ternary one with a Hilbertish curve. Uh, and that one actually called no entry. I just published it. Uh, I just pulled it out uh, and published it uh, about a couple weeks ago. But that one, if you want for some reason to do that kind of thing, uh, that one's pretty good. Um, the main problem with uh, geohashes of any sort is that a geohash is really good for finding things that are smaller. So if you have a bounding box, you can find things that are totally inside the bounding box. So finding points. If you, you know, doing big box and finding the points inside, or very small polygons or stuff. It does not work at all if you need to find, you know, if you have a point and you want to find what the state it's in. It does not work. You, well, you can make it work, but it does not, is not actually efficient in any way, and you should not do that. Um, so to do something like that, you need a R tree of some sort. Um, so Vladimir has one called R Bush. There's one that somebody else wrote called R tree that I now maintain. Um, don't use R tree. <laughs> like I, I started maintaining it before R Bush, and if you need to serialize and deserialize it, your uh, tree, that's the only time R tree is somewhat better than R Bush, because R Bush just does a uh, values by reference, but unless you have that very specific thing, don't use our tree. <laughs> um, so I wrote a, but they're all synchronous. So they're great if you're just in memory, but if you need to serialize you know, bits of it and don't want it entirely in memory, they're not gonna work. So I wrote an async R tree. It is pretty much just a port of Arbush, but async, which actually makes it somewhat easier to write because when things are asynchronous in JavaScript, you don't have to care about recursion or anything because the, the only thing that's wrong with recursion in JavaScript is that the uh, stack can get so big you'll run out of memory. But if things are async, they do not capture their stack, so you can be totally just recursive. So, um, so yeah, so I wrote an async R tree implementation. Um, the other thing was that there are, you have to optimize it somewhat differently because, in, well, the optimizing is somewhat different because the thing that actually takes a lot of time is all the data lookups. So you end up wanting very broad, shallow trees instead of a lot like deep trees that are in a, the in memory ones. But uh, yeah, I wrote that and then went to do stuff with it, and then, so I was in this city, I went to use my address, I looked up in the R tree, and I got false as well. Because all R trees care about is bounding boxes. And you know what I'm inside of? The Boston bounding box, because it's a giant concave, convex polygon. So, because that's the island all the way up to there. So that is like, <sighs> God damn it. Uh, so I had to write a library for B-box testing. It's basically the, because it turns out there is not really any good libraries for does this B-box intercept this um, GeoJSON. 
uh, and do it well. And I have another slide here that did I forget to publish? To push. Ah, oh, there we go. So, and also the weird corner case you have to hit. So, like, this one is not actually hitting any of the uh, points, and that one's the size of the ring, and that, you know. Uh, oh, yeah, and all this stuff is uh, dimensionally agnostic, so it'll work in like 40. Um, haven't really tested that as much as I'd like, but. but yeah, what's going on down here? Uh, that's, it's just, uh, it's just re <laughs> redoing it, uh, it's re uh, retiling it. Uh, you should have gotten used to this. I'm the about eighth person that's used this uh, this uh, presentation library today. Uh, yeah. So, and then I wrapped it all together with level up to make level tree, which is just uh, an R tree in level, so that you can do, uh, you know, the sort of geo queries, um, and then also PouchDB, so you can do syncing. So that's sort of it. I can show some. Oh. Is there like a trick for getting it to not look like weirdness? <laughs> Anybody know? Try minimizing uh, the text, I guess. This is Steve's Linux laptop command. Command. Uh, Was it not stretch? Is it like the stretching thingy that people were doing dealing with? Ah. Uh, minus. What? Keyboard, under keyboard command minus. Uh, so we can. No. What we'll, kind of scenarios are you are you kind of aiming towards with with this kind of um, are you like disconnected scenarios? Yeah. Or? So if you're to if he was if Steve was still here asking me about what's the next big thing, right. it's gonna be offline, right. offline first, and so saving data. And then, at, and then querying the V box of like large amounts of data that when you aren't don't have connection to some big fancy server. Right, it's like the uh, Jubal presentation. Yeah. Give me a web map even when the web's not available. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so I mentioned Pouch earlier. I'm going to talk about much more about that in my presentation tomorrow that you're all invited to um, well, about GIS and Node.js, but. That's about syncing and then using it offline and then right. syncing when you get it data again. And so that's going to be something that we're probably going to do a lot more of when people are like, oh, but I want this to work on my phone when I'm in the subway. Right. Or, you know, I, I want to use it on my laptop, but I don't actually have, you know, Wi Fi at the construction woods or whatever. Um, so that's, uh, Sort of the, uh, that's going to be the thing that people, your clients are going to be bothering you about going forward. They already are. Yeah. 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 Um, but who, if, if I show hands, who's doing kind of home cooked, home brewed, like offline, offline data collection with some sort of synchronization once the connection hits? Yeah, so it's out there. I get the request all the time, and it's uh, it's a difficult nut to figure out. I know somebody is doing um, storing tiles in Pouch, right? So they can sync it over. He's also doing that in like IE ten. So binary data in IE ten in IndexedDB, in like the, the the offline storage in web browsers are terrible. Like you have two databases, and they're both sort of competing with each other of which can have the weirdest API and like the, the worst documentation. So you have, uh, so it is not a very fun thing to have to deal with of like, I can use IndexedDB, except when I'm on Safari or old Android. We're gonna use a weird port of WebSQL that has really nothing, nothing documented about how to deal with JavaScript objects. So, because who would want to know about that in JavaScript? Guys, run out of time. Oh. <laughs> but yeah, so that's the state of that. Um, there's an index DB2 coming out soon. It's probably going to be even more complex and less usable. <laughs> if trends hold. It'll keep you employed. Yeah. Um, questions? Right? Yeah. Questions from the audience?
Anyone? Five? Yes? Four? Yeah. So I'm really intrigued by Couch. I've played with Couch a lot. Uh -huh. I've always wanted to build off one of my big geodata <laughs> motion applications. Uh -huh. um, it sounds like, I mean, Couch certainly has a very specific yeah. scenario where you want to use it. Is there, have you experimented with using Couch on the client and then being able to somehow synchronize with Postgres? Or is that? Um, so, seems like the, the synchronization you get from Couch and Couch are pretty yeah. hard to argue with. Right? So, Postgres, no. I mean, it's got its. You could write some sort of client that does that would do that, uh, but you sort of store your data in a very specific way in Couch so that you can do. Because Couch and Couch can deal with, you know, multiple people editing it, the document when they're offline or when they're both online and sort of dealing with that. So you end up having to sort of store revisions. So it's you not syncing up with a Postgres, but what you could do is there's um, a, you can run, you can sync up with this Patch TV in Node and uh, Patch TV in the browser and then, you know, use that to then update a Postgres database if you wanted. Um, you know, if I'm using Postgres, there's often like, yeah, that's not something we do, but it's something that if somebody has the time to actually bother to do it, it might be possible. Um, but I'd, yeah, the, uh, yeah. Question now. Yeah, actually, not a question, but just a comment. Anybody's looking just to steal a bunch of code. Um, we've got a project on Azure GitHub called Offline Editor JS. I was looking at it here, and uh, it just uses local browser cache, but it has the whole model of being able to go offline, and it also does tile fetching too. So it basically cookie cuts your vectors and your tiles, puts them in your browser store, then you go offline, make some edits, and then go back online. So you may not be interested in all the code, but there may be some something there that's bits and pieces that you can yeah. reuse. Yeah, I use it on projects like for, for building a trail app. So you know, if you want to go hike and take some pictures and stuff like that, you can like cookie cut some stuff out and then yeah. go up the field, take some pictures, get back online and go to the data store, and boom, yeah. it goes. So just just something to think about. Right? Great. Yeah, the one of the it turns out one thing that's really hard to do in a browser is figure out if you're online or not. Because <laughs> there, there's it's there's no there's online and offline events and they just they just they do nothing. It's it's you have to it's far harder than it should be. So any code that a field that's already written that, just take it, like and run with it. Um, <laughs> Care for it. Yeah. Cause that's and you're gonna find yourself doing that a lot more. We have another uh, hand over. Yeah? This is another one of these like abusive, not really a comment, comments, questions. Mm -hmm. uh, for browser storage stuff, uh, uh -huh. Brian LaRue wrote uh, Lawn Share. Yes. Which does like, an amazing job of abstracting away all the weird, like, is it WebSQL? Is it IndexedDB? Is it yeah. Cookies? <clears throat> and that's so, Lawn Share? Yeah, Lawn Share JS. Yeah. So if you just like, say, I have this blob of data, I want to store it somewhere. <laughs> Yeah, so the, there has actually been some talk about using that in Pouch. The problem with that, about really any abstraction, is that when you have, when you then need to like do, ask questions and do queries on it, you you end up having a giant performance hit. So that so PouchDB has built-in adapters for IndexedDB, WebSQL, and level level up. Each of them has totally different ways of like iterating, totally different ways of, of you know, getting related stuff, and you just ended up, you know, it was just too slow because, and so you sort of had to work with the, uh, the sort of bare stuff database. Thankfully, there's a guy Nolan who did all this work on a web SQL and IndexedDB. I honestly, if my life depended on having to put some data in an IndexedDB. I might not be able to do it because uh, I just like focus on all the other parts. Uh, but yeah, if, if you have to do something less complex and just storing key value stuff, Launcher is a great one. There's also one called Local Forge, 
it's sort of like local storage, but it's not as bad as local storage because it, you know, it's async. Um, and well, local storage is really slow, so IndexedDB and WebSQL are much faster. Uh, ironically, even though WebSQL is depreciated and probably going to be taken out of Chrome at some point in the really probably distant future, uh, it is a lot faster than IndexedDB uh, because it's just SQLite 3 with a small, tiny little wrapper around it. So you can get some pretty fast stuff there, but only on Safari and Chrome. Well, we have time for one more question slash comment masquerading as question. Observation. Good. Why? Yeah, a really good question about workers. Uh, uh -huh. So what's the deal with uh, transferable objects on IE? Because I, I heard that like there are many sources that say that you can transfer one object at a time if you can do this. So, so transferable objects refers to you can do a, there's a thing in workers where you can just sort of like copy an array buffer over uh, and then you are not able to use it so you basically send it from the one side to the other, and you, after you send it, you then can't touch it. It's gone from the, uh, from the side that sent it. Uh, the thing that's never really documented anywhere is that it's not just array buffers that you can do that with. It's also port objects, so that you can actually send a message port over to a worker. So, you can, so a message port is something that's basically like, an, like a telephone in that you put stuff into one end, and it comes out, the events come out in the other end. So you can send that to a worker, um, and that's the thing that, so that IE, you can have a, a message port in the sort of the second, um, in the second position to a transfer over, uh, but if you give it an array, which is what everything else takes, they take an array of uh, array buffers, it will just explode and throw an error, because <laughs> why would they be helpful or anything? So. That, that's what you can do in IE, is just transfer a, a port, a uh, message port. But what does it mean practically? Uh, it means that you, it's not very useful. Uh, because <laughs> the, the main way that that is useful is in, uh, in places that don't have subworkers. You could, you can take, since you can't basically create a worker from inside another worker, you could sort of simulate that by creating a second worker and then just transferring a port object to both of them so that you could sort of pretend that this worker created this one even though it's just in a different one. Um, I have no idea why you'd want to use that otherwise. Um, <laughs> it just seems not very helpful. Uh, MDN on uh, worker page says that you can, like, instead of uh, putting an array of uh, array buffers, you can uh, put one array buffer and it will transfer it. But I didn't try that. No, that doesn't. No, they're the, only, the only thing. So yes, yeah, it's, it's not. It's not uh, well. So on IE that doesn't work. On everything else that does work, but it does have to be an array. What, what does so the that works? So no, no. It, it you yeah you can you can pass array buffers and trans, you can transfer them, mm -hmm. um, and then it works just like it says in MDN. I think it's what you said er, earlier. But yeah, it works just like it says in Indian, and then on the main thread or whoever transfers that object, that uh, that object is no longer usable at all. Like it's so instead of having to copy uh, or be structured cloning, it just takes it and takes the pointer and gives it to the other thread. Hmm. But I the one, on, the one on the thread that passed yeah. it, that pointer is essentially it's pointing to null. It's pointing to nothing. Yeah. So they they didn't have to. You don't have to pass any message, you just pass the pointer. Yeah. But, and, but that doesn't work in IE. It, it, you, can do a diff, you can put a different thing there, because you can also transfer that port, so that's where it's often very confusing. Um, if anybody wants to just edit that MDN article like right now uh, and make that more clear, that would be cool. Um, it's also where it's, it's not really in the, what we expect, uh, just, uh, structured cloning, it's not really the same thing. Those are. Structured clone is clone is, the, is the one where you don't transfer the operation. But no, if you clone a transferable object which includes message ports, uh, it, it, that's defined in the yeah yeah that that the, 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 well that you don't that you don't clone it right. 
Star Trek clone, yeah. Star Trek clone is the technical term for the way you pass JSON because JSON, JSON-like things because you can't actually uh, stringify with JSON something that's got circular references or anything. So they use something called structured clone, um, which it turned out, because we had an issue in PatchDB recently, that there, that's a recursive algorithm, both of them. Both uh, JSON stringify and uh, structured clone are both recursive in most browsers and will throw a call stack exceeded error if you have something that's too um, deeply nested. Let's clap it up for Calvin. All right.